Well, John Coltrane was one of the most well-known jazz musicians of the 20th century. There's a picture of him. Even though he passed away at the age of 40 to liver cancer, he left a legacy behind him in the music world known as a saxophonist and a composer. He hung out with the likes of Duke Ellington and Miles Davis. And his, well, his most well-known album is called A Love Supreme. It was nominated for two Grammys. And I found a clip of just Coltrane playing A Love Supreme. Here's a picture of him. And he gets into this place during a section of the song, and it's as if the notes are flowing from the depth of his inmost being. Can you see that just in his, in his face, how it's, it's coming forth? Well, I want you to hold this image in your head and in your heart as we enter into the book of Ephesians, because the first paragraph in Ephesians chapter 1 is Paul's love supreme. It's, I can picture him turning to the prison guard that's watching over his house arrest and saying something like this, like, hey, hey, bud, it's about to get real. I'm in the flow. You better buckle up. I'm in the flow, and my flow, I want you to think of this as like Paul's theological jazz rift, playing notes about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We're just going to let him play that over our hearts today as we jump in to the book of Ephesians. So if you haven't already done so, open up your Bibles there. You should have a note sheet that you picked up on the way in. Those of you joining us online, welcome. I suspect with the weather today, we've got even more folks joining us online. And those of you in the south, you just don't know what you're missing here in the north. On, you know, who knows what you're missing here? But I think your online host can direct you to the uh, message notes online as well. Just a reset backdrop for the book of Ephesians is the, Paul's entry into the city of Ephesus. Ephesus is a city that knows about getting in the flow, okay? They knew all, all about the flow that way. Because if you remember, I put in your notes, right, some of the history and the back. I want you to think of Ephesus, and N.T. Wright says it this way. I put this quote in your notes. Ephesus is a great city hub of trade routes of the world, full of culture and money and temples and politics and soldiers and merchants and slaves and power, social, civic, religious, and spiritual power. When you think Ephesus, I want you to think New York City meets Sedona. I want you to think Stranger Things meets Wall Street. You with me? That's Ephesus. It's a place where Paul encountered. He went to the city on his third missionary journey. We covered this back in August. Here's a map, reset the route that he took, how he got there, and when he arrived there, he discovered a group of people whose lives, it was about 300,000 when Paul entered that city around in the first century, population 300K, and the, the whole environment was dominated by the Roman goddess known as Artemis. She was called the great mother goddess. She was the goddess of fertility and life. She was the goddess of prosperity. There was a massive temple to Artemis. Here's a picture of Artemis's temple. It's so big, 425 feet long, 220 feet wide, 60 feet tall. When Paul entered Ephesus, here's what he encountered. He encountered a bunch of people who knew how to get in the flow spiritually. The question in Ephesus wasn't whether you were worshiping. The question in Ephesus is why weren't you worshiping Artemis? Because to be an Ephesian is to be an Artemis worshiper and to pay your Artemis sacrifices. And so it's an environment that's so dominated by this Roman, in, in the Roman language, is the goddess Diana to the Greeks known as Artemis. And so Paul rolls into this town, begins to speak to them about the name of Jesus, the power of the gospel, plants a flag of the gospel there in a few, just a small group of believers. They come to know Jesus. And so he takes them away, Acts 19, to the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And for two years, it says he met with them every day. And some of you think once a week is plenty to come together. How about every day for two years? How about 700 consecutive worship gatherings? Wouldn't that be something for the agenda? That's what Paul was doing. You say, what is he doing? 700 consecutive gatherings like that. Well, he's helping them do what needed to be done to be a disciple of Jesus in Ephesus. 
unlearn the ways of Artemis and ground yourself in the ways of Jesus. He was building a Christ-centered worldview. And to do that, he knew he had to dismantle the Artemis-centered worldview of Ephesus. And that was a big part. And he knew it was so significant is that he needed, it wasn't enough just to kind of get together every once in a while. He said, we got to meet daily. We got to do this for two years because that's how much is on the line. And that's how deeply entrenched the ways of this world and the cultural moment that Paul was in were in those early believers. And so I want you to think of the disciple-making work of our church, which I think is supposed to be the disciple-making work of any church in the name of Jesus. It's really lecture hall of Tyrannus. That's really what this is about. I think the cultural moment we find ourselves in in 2023 is Tyrannus-like, Ephesian-like. I think we got to double down in all of our work. I think the journey we're on here as a church, like, say, what's Eagle Church all about? We want to see a Christ-centered world view developed in every person who says yes to Jesus. In order to do that, we're going to have to unlearn some things that we've internalized some intentionally, some unintentionally. The ways of this world, the secular, humanistic, relativistic, self-at-the-center worldview, that's just the air that we're breathing, and we internalize it, and we adopt these scripts, and we begin to live out of that and say, and then you come to know Jesus, and you got to, how do I begin to unlearn the ways of the world and internalize the ways of Jesus? It's called building a Christian worldview. And that's what we're doing around here. That's why there's a group of you this morning, right, at 8.30 this morning, with Sarah and the class, it's Worldview Part 2, and, and you guys are doing those very practical things. That's why we're doing small groups during the week, and you take the study guide from the messages, and you have discussion, and you pray, and you support and encourage. That's why we're encouraging you to get to the secret place. You got to get to the secret place. You got to get some quiet space. You got to get alone with Jesus. That's why we ask you to declare today to be a tree day. How are we doing on our tree days? We should be seven days into that, right? Tree day. Tomorrow's a tree day. Paul had 700 consecutive tree day declarations with those young believers in Ephesus because that's how much is at stake. Gang, do you see this is our cultural moment? 75 minutes once or twice a month coming to church, it's not going to cut it. There's too much at stake. There's too many forces at work. The pull is too strong. The messages are too loud. And so you've got to say, I've got to double down. I've got to get connected into a group. I've got to be a part of some classes. I've got to commit to be a part of church on a regular basis. Why? Because it's lecture hall of Tyrannus moment. Church, that's what it is. That's why for the next couple of months, we're going to be in the book of Ephesians. I think it's so applicable to our cultural moment today. We're going to start in chapter one, and we're just going to work our way through the book all the way up until Palm Sunday. And so if you need a good place to begin, reset your scripture reading, if you're looking for a place, immerse yourself in the book of Ephesians for the next several weeks. And we're going to start today in this section that I'm calling Paul's Love Supreme. Because here's Paul, he's about 60 years old. He's lived following Jesus now for about 30 years. It's been 30 years since the road to Damascus, Acts chapter 9, when Jesus stood in the way to show him the way. Anybody been there? That might be your 2023. Jesus standing in the way to show you the way. That's what happened to Paul in Acts 9. 30 years from that moment, four years removed from when he first visited Ephesus, he's now sitting down to write a letter to this group of Christians who planted a church. The gospel got planted in Ephesus. Right in the middle of that, a church got planted. And so he's writing them a letter, and he's seen so many things over his 30 years. He's seen light, he's seen darkness go to light, he's seen death go to life, he's seen sickness to health, he's seen all these things, he's seen churches planted, he's seen disciples raised up, and he's looking back over the landscape of his 30 years, and with the revelation of the Holy Spirit, he's about to play a theological jazz rift that I think is so helpful for our hearts Acts chapter 28, here's the context of these two years. It says, this is what Luke writes about this moment. It says, for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to him. Boldly and without hindrance, he preached the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus. So this is where Paul wrote the four prison epistles, of which Ephesians is one of them. So Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians were written during the time he spent two years under house arrest in Rome. That's where he wrote those four books. 
Do you see why it's important to understand the life of the Apostle Paul? If you can understand Paul's life in the book of Acts, it gives you context to 13 of the 27 New Testament books. That's why we've been spending the last year doing this, because I want to give you a handle on how to, when you open up your New Testament, if you can grasp Paul's life and you can understand how his missionary journeys went, it helps you understand so many other parts of your New Testament. Because you remember, he went into Galatia, and then later on, he wrote a letter called Galatians. He went and planted churches in Colossae, and then he wrote a letter called Colossians. He went into Ephesus, and he planted a church there in Ephesus, and now we're looking at the letter he wrote called Ephesians. And so here we're going to jump in. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, underlined in your Bibles, blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Verse 4, for he chose, underlined chose in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us, underlined to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. So here's what we're going to do over the next several minutes. We're going to unpack the work of God the Father, the work of God the Son, and the work of God the Spirit in playing this jazz riff called a love supreme over our hearts. And three words attached to the work of God the Father. I had you underline them there. The Father blesses, chooses, and adopts. Do you see that? The blessing, the choosing, and the adopting work of God the Father. This is what Paul experienced in Damascus Road in Acts 9. This is what Peter and John experienced when they were fishing on the banks of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus walks up to them and says, leave your nets and follow me, right there, that moment. This is what Moses experienced when he's floating down the Nile in a basket, and he's plucked out of the Nile and appointed into leadership. And this is what a young lady named Mary Magdalene You heard that person before in the New Testament, Mary Magdalene. She struggled with emotional, mental, relational. She had a really hard life. And then this moment happened. Mary. says the Lord who created you and he who formed you. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You I can't commend that series enough to you, by the way, if you haven't already made your way through The Chosen. You know, it's free, it's an app, it's available, I think it's Amazon Prime's got it now, like, that would be a great, like, you need an assignment for this first part of the year, start working your way through, starting in season one, they're just wrapping up, I think, season three right now. Do you remember where you were at in that moment? Do you remember that moment for you? Or maybe that's today for someone. For someone listening online, maybe today is your Mary of Magdala moment where Jesus walks, right? He walks towards you and calls you by name. That's the work of the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, where he comes to you. Ephesians chapter 1 says there's a moment in our life where 
we, we start grasping that God knows me, God sees me, he's aware of everything and every, every detail of my life. He knows all about it. He knew everything about Mary of Magdala, and he came toward her, and he says, I know you, I see you, I choose you, you are mine. I know what you've done, I know where you've strayed, I know how long you've strayed there. I know all the stuff that you think no one else knows about. God knows all of it. And that father walks towards you. Even when you've given up on yourself, even when others have given up on you. Here's what you need to hear from Ephesians chapter 1 today in this point. The work of God the Father. He says, I, I know you. I see you. I created you. I choose you. You are mine. I adopt you as a son or a daughter of the king. Can you feel that note being played over your heart right now? It's unbelievable to internalize this reality, especially for so many who've experienced rejection in this life. And you don't have to live very long in these cultural moments, right, to get on the side of rejection. I mean, some of you got a PhD in rejection through some of your life experiences. Rejection from that relationship that you were convinced was headed somewhere. Rejection from that dream job or dream school. Rejection from that theater club that you so wanted that part only to hear you aren't good enough. A rejection from that coach to be on that team only to hear you don't have what it takes, you're cut. And on and on we could go. Every time the world says to you, I don't want you, Paul says in Ephesians 1, you need to hear the God and Father say to you, I want you. You're on the team, you have the parts, you're in the family, you've got the acceptance letter, you've been given the job, and this job has eternal implications. Notice what Stuart Briscoe says, I put this quote in your notes, I think it's very powerful to internalize. He says, to accept at the depth of our being that we are chosen by God is the antidote, hear this, for our insecurity, our neurotic fears, our striving to be accepted, and our self-depreciation. Church, do you grasp the implications of this? I think they're staggering. I'm calling it the live from, we live from, not for. It's the from, not for posture. This is what we're talking about. We live from blessing, not for blessing. We live from acceptance, not for acceptance. We live from grace, not for grace. From, not for. Say from, not for. For, not for. I think that'd be a pretty solid, like, t-shirt hat on Etsy right now. From not for. Do you see the difference? Like from not for. Because when you try to spend your one and only life living for acceptance, living for blessing, living for approval, living for redemption, living for forgiveness, you end up exhausted and anxious. You're weary from carrying a load you were never intended to carry. And you're anxious because you never know if enough is enough. That's what's living for if you flip it around. If you try to live for the blessing and acceptance, and here the invitation of Ephesians 1 is, you know what you do? Here you build your life on the from. You build it on the from. From what? I see you, I know you, I choose you, I adopt you, you are mine. From that place, go live. That's the notes God the Father's playing from Ephesians 1 over the heart. A note of blessing. That's the language in one which says the spiritual blessings in the heavenly realm. These are the notes. The blessings are choosing, adopting, knowing, seeing, pursuing. This is the Father saying, I'm coming for you. Even when you weren't looking for me, I was looking for you. Mary of Magdala, it's a powerful episode. It's the first episode in The Chosen. And the scene is, she's not looking for Jesus. He comes looking for her. And boy, isn't that commentary on all of our lives. That's what Ephesians chapter 1, the first section, is getting at. First element of a love supreme. Second one is the work of God the Son. Do you see this in the text starting in verse 7? Look at verse 7 in your Bibles or up here on the screen. In Him, speaking about Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, which... By the way, how powerful is that Charity Gale song, Thank You, Jesus, for the Blood? That's like a modern-day hymn. You need to put that one on repeat on your playlist. 
I mean, it's just so powerful. Team, thank you for playing through and leading through it so well this morning because it helps us internalize this reality in accordance with the riches of his grace. Verse 8, that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding, and he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times will have reached their fulfillment. Catch this, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So the work of God the Father is the blessing, choosing, adopting. And now Paul says the work of God the Son, do you see it? Is the redeeming, forgiving, and revealing. The Son redeems, the Son forgives, and the Son reveals. He redeems by His blood. Do you see that in verse 7? He forgives us of our sin through that blood, and He reveals God's will to us in verse 9. And I put in your notes, the word redeems, I think it's just so richly rooted. It's the word apotrolos. Do you see it in your notes there? It says, to a released effect by payment of a ransom. So it's this release you experience when a ransom has been paid. Another term for it is deliverance. The freedom you experience when a debt's paid. That's what the word redemption means. He says, Jesus plays this note of redemption over your heart. When you're encountering a debt, there's no way you could pay on your own. Jesus lifts that from you. That's redemption. That's being a people of apotrolos. Do you remember where you were at on June 23rd, 2019? Do you know where you were at? I know where I was. I was standing right here. Here's where I was at. Here's a picture. I was standing right here with the vice president of First Merchant Bank. And we were burning the mortgage note on this building and property, June 23rd, 2019. Do you remember that? At its peak... That was a $4.5 million piece of paper. $26,000 a month is what we were paying. Those of you longtime Eagle folks around here, you remember the elders' meetings, the staff meetings, and the congregational meetings where we talked about the weight of this debt. Now, on the other side, we're grateful that we could borrow some money and build a building and purchase some ground. Without the ability to do that, we wouldn't have been able to be where we are. So, But nonetheless, once we got the debt, we felt the weight of carrying this load. Do you remember that? I'll tell you, I remember it. (laughs) I remember how many mornings in my office, on my knees. I remember back in 2014 when we talked about circling our Jerichos in Joshua chapter 6. And we said, we're going to ask God to bring down some walls, right? We're going to pray circles around our Jerichos. Do you remember that? I had a Jericho, I wrote it down, 4.5 million sized Jericho. I circled it. I said, in Jesus, I'm on my knees and my office calling out, Lord, can you bring down a $4.5 million wall? I remember going to the prayer room and just crying out to God for the day. One day, could we be released from this and having no idea how we're going to get from where we are to there. And in the span of five years, from 2014 to 2019, through your generosity and so many other God moments, God lifted that debt. He burned the mortgage in five years. Are you kidding me? I remember in that journey, the person who called me when we were first starting to talk about this, and somebody called me and says, hey, can you meet me for coffee? Which as a pastor, you have no idea what the, that can be anything, right? I mean, I didn't have any much contact with this particular person in a while. And he said, hey, I hear your burden to do something about the debt. He said, my wife and I'd like to put the first $250,000 on the table. I thought, this is a really good coffee. This is starting out really well. <laughs> By the way, if any of you want to take me out for coffee for that conversation. That's... <laughs> and he says, let's make it a matching gift. And you guys remember that when we announced that. And then that year, actually, we gave three hundred thousand, and that family matched three, and ended up being three hundred thousand. They put three hundred thousand down. You put three hundred, put six hundred thousand. I mean, stuff like that just started happening. We sold property for crazy. We had these people calling us about building some retirement, uh, kind of elderly care living facility back here, and on and on and on we could go. But the point here's what I want you to remember: those of you who were around during that journey, do you remember the moment when the last payment was made and the announcement was given that the 4.5 million dollar debt load had been lifted burned gone 
Do you remember that moment? <laughs> That's the same word Paul uses in Ephesians 1 for what God the Son does when we walk into this life and we pile up a mortgage of sin that there's no pot. We couldn't pay this off in 10 lifetimes. The amount of sin any one of us accumulates from the moment we take our first breath as a child to the moment we go to the grave, we accumulate a sin debt that Paul says, hey, let this jazz riff play over your heart. God the Son, he comes and he lifts that from your life through his blood and the work on the cross. That's what it means to be a people of apotroos. To be delivered from a debt we could never do on our own. Which is why I think one of the most significant questions that every human has to answer in life. Hear this now. What are you going to do with your sin? What are you going to do with it? Now culturally right now, there's sounds like a fair amount of denial with sin. I had a friend this week tell me that they have recently removed sin from Webster's Dictionary. I haven't done all the research on this, but sounds like there's quite a movement. It's, no, just remove sin. Just take it out of the vocabulary. Who, who gets to decide that? Remember I told you about the iPhone already decided that. When you type sin into your iPhone, it tries to change it to sun. It doesn't know what sin is. Huh. So our cultural moments is, what are you going to do with your sin? Well, you can deny it. How's that working for you? How's that working out? You can rationalize it. You can run from it. You can numb it, medicate it, try to push it away. How, what do you, you can try to manage your sin in your own wisdom and strength. How's that working out? Or here's what Ephesians 1 says. <laughs> Why don't you bring your sin to God the Son and let him lift it from your life and bring his healing grace to you. I choose that. What are you going to do with your sin? Paul says, Here, here's one way. Here's what you, in Ephesus, this was absolutely radical. No one was talking about this. In Ephesus, what did they do with their sin? They brought it to the temple of Artemis and they paid off their debts through all kinds of ritual prostitution sacrifices at the temple and they had idols and all these things. Remember when, because when people started to come to Jesus, they started to burn their idols and they stopped buying the trinkets around Artemis. Remember that? And he got in a bunch of trouble and he got thrown in the stadium and they wanted to kill him. So listen, there were implications because of what? Because Paul was preaching this, God the Father, he blesses, he chooses, he adopts, and God the Son, he redeems, he comes and forgives. This is what he does, he lifts the sin from you. You don't need to go to Artemis anymore. Artemis is out of business, King Jesus is in town. Do you think some things started to shift around in Ephesus, huh? And maybe that's for you today. Maybe that's 2023 for someone. Maybe you've spent a good chunk of your life trying to handle sin, however you thought best to handle sin, and you've come to the end of yourself. And Ephesians 1 says this morning, why don't you step into this? Why don't you let Jesus, God the Son, lift that sin from your life and bring his healing grace to you? Why not enter the people of Apatroas? The people of deliverance, the people of the redeemed. This is what Paul calls a love supreme. A God the Father who blesses and chooses and adopts. A God the Son who redeems and forgives. And he reveals God's will to us. And now, God the Spirit. Last section, God the Spirit. What's the Spirit do? He seals and he guarantees. Do you see this now? Look at verse 13. And you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, follow this now, you were marked in him, underlined with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Underline seal and underline guarantee. That's what Paul says, right? God the Spirit does. He seals and he guarantees. I want you to think of it this way. The Holy Spirit is God's UV mark on the follower of Jesus. I want you to look up here. 
This is what the Holy Spirit is in the life of a believer. You couldn't, it's been on my hand the whole time. You can't see it always, right? When a person who says yes to Jesus, they receive the Holy Spirit. There's this Christ in you, Christ for you, Christ through you. And then you can't really see it, right? But then under certain circumstantial light, here's your deposit. Here's your guarantee. Huh. I see you. I know you. I choose you. You are mine. You are mine. And notice Paul says, this is your marked. This is your mark. Christ in you, Christ through you, Christ for you, by the Holy Spirit. This is the work. And at certain moments, right, you just kind of get in this space and you go, it's, it's God the Spirit. He's, this is the seal that he guarantees an inheritance to come. You see, in this life, church, we get... Forte, we get a little taste, you get a little splash. Some of you have experienced some amazing God moments already this year, and you've seen God at work in this world in ways that just take your breath away. This is your deposit guaranteeing an inheritance. Do you realize in this life, it's just splashes of what the eternal glory awaits? And Paul says, that's God the Holy Spirit's work, to seal. And for those of you who really wrestle with whether you're really saved or not, some of you really wrestle a lot with whether you could lose your salvation. Do you see how important Ephesians 1 is into that space? Some of you keep recycling a bunch of decisions you really regret. You go, ah, jeez, maybe I'm not really in Team Jesus. Maybe I'm not really on the Jesus train. Do you see? Paul says, hey, remember all this salvation work when you go through Ephesians 1? Notice the framework of this Love Supreme song. All, all the main characters in the story, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Do you see this? Like, it wasn't on you and I's shoulders to begin with. It was the Father who did the initiating and the choosing and the adopting. It was the Son who did the redeeming and the forgiving. And it's the Spirit who does the sealing and the guaranteeing. So hear this. God, it's like God doubling down on his investment is what you're, we're supposed to see through this song here. He's doubling down. He pay, he's paid a mighty price for you and I to become his children. And he's going to protect that investment. And he's going to guarantee that what he's begun, he's going to finish. That's what you can rest in. Rest in this. If you've said yes to Jesus at some point in your life, and in just a few minutes, I'm going to give you an opportunity to. If you've never, why not this morning? But the moment you say yes to Jesus, he's got you to the starting line. Here's what I want you to rest in. If he got you to the starting line, Paul says, through the seal of the Holy Spirit, through this, he gets you to the starting line. Here's what you got to remember. I'll get you to the finish line. 70, 80, 90 years down the road it might be. I might have to drag you there. For some of you right now, come on. Some of you, it's a bit dragging right now, but I, hey, listen. It was C.S. Lewis, who I quoted last week, he said he came kicking and screaming into the kingdom of God. He said he put his heels in the ground and he got drugged across the starting line. And then when he lost his wife to cancer, he, he almost bailed on the whole scene. But what kept him? What kept him? Right here. God says, what I started in you, I will finish. If I started it, I'll finish it. I will get you to the end. You can rest in that. And so maybe that sets someone free from a cycle of having to revisit whether you're really... Look, it's not on your shoulders to start with. It's God the Father. He initiates. He chooses. He adopts. It's the Son who redeems and forgives, and it's the Spirit who seals and guarantees. Now, you're a part of the equation because it's your life. What's your part? Your part is you've got to engage your will, and what are you going to, are you going to say yes to this? Because there are a whole bunch of people in Ephesus whom Paul was proclaiming this message to, and some jumped on the Jesus train, got a flag of the gospel planted in their heart. They started to have this song, a love supreme, played over the melody of their heart. I think this was the call to worship Sunday after Sunday in the hall of Tyrannus. This was it. And then there was a whole bunch of others who said, spiritual Heisman, no thank you. I'm going my own way. 
I'm going, to ma- I, I'm, going my own, I'm going back to Artemis. So our role is to engage our will and to, the posture is one of receive. You receive this. You're like Mary of Magdala there. You're standing and Jesus comes to you. And do you see that posture where she just kind of receives this invitation and blessing? She didn't, she didn't achieve it. She didn't accomplish it. She just received all that the Father, Son, and the Spirit has done for her. So worship team, why don't you come on back up? Because I want to wrap us up today. I want you to internalize some notes of a song. I want you to put Ephesians 1 this week on repeat, okay? This is your this year's repeat, right? Ephesians 1 this week. I want you to let these truths just play over your heart again and again and again. What truths that God the Father, He blesses, He chooses, and He adopts. He says, I see you, I know you, I choose you, you are mine. You play that over your heart over. And that God the Son, He redeems, and He forgives, and He reveals There's absolutely nothing you're battling in your life, no matter how deep that valley, no matter how dark that day, that Jesus' grace and love is not deeper still. He can lift it from your life. And that God the Son, He seals and He guarantees. And if you've wondered how you're going to get from where you are to the finish line, Paul says, rest in this. The God who began a good work in you, He's going to carry it on to completion. He will get you there. You have a deposit guaranteeing an inheritance to come. Church, I think this is a love supreme. I think the implications are staggering. I think it's a message the world, all the way back in Ephesus a couple thousand years ago, Still so applicable in 2023, is it or not? Is there a more pertinent message for the globe today than that there is a God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who's on the move, who looks at a humanity that's broken and says, I didn't give up on you. I see you. I know you. I've got plans and purposes for you. You are mine. I call you to me. This God's still at work. Even in 2023, even in the mess that we're in, God's still at work. The Son's still redeeming and He's still forgiving. And the Spirit is still sealing and guaranteeing. And our role is to say yes. To receive. Why not you? Why not today? Why not now? Let's pray. And so, Lord, I'm just picturing John Coltrane right now when he was just, ah. On that note, from the inmost being, I just picked right now, Lord, we're just in that space where you go, this is an unbelievable revelation from Ephesians chapter 1, that you're this kind of a God that would pursue us in these ways and offer us life eternal. It's just, it's amazing. It takes our breath away. And so maybe this morning for you, Maybe you've heard all about this before, but this morning it gets personal. And for whatever reason, some background you've come from, it's never gotten personal. Why not today? Why not now? Make it personal. So how do I make it personal? Simply in the quietness of your heart, you just say this, Jesus, save me. I confess my sin to you. Lift this sin from my life. I say yes to you. Here's my life. Take it. My life is yours. Fill me with your spirit. Forgive me of my sin. Lead me and guide me. I say yes to you today. I want to become a Christian. I want to be a follower of Jesus today. Just say it. Quietness, that's all you got to do. Jesus saved me. And then others of you, you remember when that's happened, and you can remember the moment, but if you were honest, maybe a whole lot of stuff has gotten mixed up, and you've been distracted and gone down all kinds of other roads. Today is your comeback day. You just work the muscle of comeback. Return. Just return. Just come back. Come back to the God and Father of your Lord Jesus Christ. Come back. And so in the quietness of your heart, that's all you got to pray. Say, Lord, I'm coming back. 
And when you turn your face towards him, here's what you're going to find. You're going to find his face has always been turned towards you in love. That's what you're going to find. You're going to find what Mary Magdala found. Eyes looking at you, calling to you. And then lastly, there's folks here, we just surrender and worship and awe. Thank you for calling us your own. Thank you for the honor and privilege it is to be a son or a daughter of the Most High. As this song plays over our hearts, may we go out into a world and may it spill over and bring light into darkness. We pray for Jesus' sake. Amen.